Hey guys, thanks for listening to the Ringer NBA show. We're about to get into this episode of Group Chat, but before we do, I just wanted to let you know about a couple of Ringer NBA related things. First of all, we have a new Twitter feed at Ringer NBA. You can find great highlights, great banter, great memes. Great observations all over there on the new Twitter feed at Ringer NBA. We also have a Facebook group, Facebook page. Is that what the kids call it? Facebook page, uh, facebook.com slash group slash Ringer NBA. You can go there and get into discussions with fellow NBA fans and maybe even some Ringer staffers. Also, we have Ringer NBA Palooza, which is our, our, I guess, annual video festival to kick off the NBA season. That's happening Tuesday, opening night of the NBA. For a full day, we'll be offering you guys video programming. We'll have uh, previews. We have some very funny videos. We have uh, a lot of Bill stuff. And it all culminates with the Celtic Sixers game where Bill and a bunch of other people will be doing a watch along, some special guests for that. Pretty excited for that. So be sure you're checking out The Ringer all day long on Tuesday. We'll have some great features. Uh, Jordan Conn wrote about Ennis Cantor today. We have some awesome features coming up. So keep it dialed into The Ringer, man, no matter where you are. Basketball is very good. Anthony Davis will win the MVP this year. The Hawks trading Doncic was a smart move. What if the Cavs are better without LeBron? Basketball is very good. Hello, and welcome to the Ringer NBA show. This is Group Chat, and these guys fucking need me! Taylor O'Shaughnessy. <laughs> I didn't know where you were going with that. Justin Barrier. I never know what to say here. Paolo. What's up? How you doing, man? Good. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for joining us today. I know it was tough to uh, c- carve it out of your busy schedule. <laughs> That's me. Uh, this is the All Jimmy Butler Everything podcast. We will talk a little bit else. We'll talk a little bit more about other pr- teams, but right now the Minnesota Timberwolves have made themselves a complete and utter spectacle mm. on the eve of the, f- of the season. I-, I cannot remember a team imploding <laughs> this early into the cycle. <laughs> They're not even in the season yet. And uh, it is one of the most comical, dysfunctional, who's afraid of Virginia Wolf? except it's who's afraid of Jimmy Butler. <laughs> it's Jimmy and the Wolves. Um, I will do a little recap of everything that happened yesterday. Do and we can get sound in- effects? Wow. If you want to do any like <laughs> like wind blowing or wolves howling, go ahead. Chimes, perhaps. Um, okay, so yesterday, Jimmy Butler, who has been away from the team, who has requested a trade, who had Tom Thibodeau. Now, in retrospect, this is very funny. Had Thibodeau come to Los Angeles <laughs> to be like, I do really want to trade. Right. There had been rumors last week when we recorded our podcast. We thought a deal with Miami was on the brink. We thought it was on the about to get finalized. Well, it turns it was. out, oh, and it turned out that at the very last second, reportedly, Minnesota asked for a sweetener, whether it was take on Gorgie's contract, whatever it was. It was going to be for Josh Richardson and some other stuff. Uh, Bam was not a part of it. Apparently, little did I know when I was recording a podcast. Uh, <laughs> so we we had a week basically of like we thought it was going to be a done deal. Jimmy's away from the team. The Timberwolves are getting ready. They don't look particularly good. Derrick Rose is starting at shooting guard. Uh, Thursday, Wednesday rolls around. And Wednesday rolls around and it's reported that Jimmy Butler will be at practice that day in Mm -hmm. Minnesota. Jimmy Butler apparently shows up. This is according to Chris Haynes at Yahoo. Butler showed up to practice late and subbed himself into a scrimmage (laughs) on the third team to go against the starting group, according to league sources. Quote, screaming from the top of his lungs, Butler (laughs) uttered taunts at his teammates, including, they ain't shit, they soft, league sources said. Thank you, league sources. Most (laughs) of the players knew the invectives were directed at Towns and Wiggins. Carl Anthony and Andrew. Thank you, sources. (laughs) Haynes goes on, neither Towns nor Wiggins confronted Butler at any point. Some players were motivated by Butler's theatrics, but others were distraught and speechless, most notably Towns. When practice concluded, Butler stormed out of the facility and skipped stretching. That's not a great idea Mm. when you're as injury prone as Jimmy. (laughs) Mm -hmm. With the rest of his teammates. Wiggins did give Butler hand dap. Yes! You fucking clown for doing that. (laughs) Before Butler's exit. Towns, this is the saddest thing I've ever read. Towns then gathered the players in a huddle and gave a message centered on everyone keeping their emotions in check. (laughs) That horse has left the barn. According to some of the players, the message felt empty. Look, I tweeted this yesterday, but... 
Was it as empty as his stats? God, wow. Haley. All right. That's a, it's a tweet so good, it's okay for you to recycle it on this podcast. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, cross-promotion. Wolves beat writer Darren Wolfson wrote on Twitter, he texted with a player, and when I asked how Butler looked, the player responded, quote, I'm legally blind. <laughs> because there was a lot of like, hey, I don't know what's happening. There was a, there was a moment where everybody was going to try and pretend like this didn't happen, it sounds like. So Anthony Tolliver, when he was asked after practice, like, was Butler there? He was like, he was there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and Jeff Teague was like, yeah, Jimmy, just being Jimmy. And this guy was like, I'm legally blind. I didn't say anything. Didn't say anything. And this was all within like what? Probably an hour. This is like a ninety-minute stretch. Yeah, well, this it was is like reported a stretch. that the players found out while they were still inside. The, like stuff started leaking while they were still in the yes. facility, and that upset them. Me too. It upset Jimmy Butler as well, which is ironic. So <laughs> while all this is happening, at some point between deciding he's going to go to practice and attending practice or whatever, however, this that chronology is not as important as what, what I'm about to say, which is that at some point Jimmy Butler or his camp, reached out to Rachel Nichols at ESPN and was just like, why don't you come to Minnesota for an interview? I feel like I have something to say. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Great weather this time of the year. And so, some of the more cynical among us have speculated that this was all orchestrated and staged to provide the maximum platform, the loudest possible platform for Jimmy to reiterate the Wolves are trash and he wants out. I feel for him, he's trying everything. On SportsCenter. So Rachel Nichols flies to Minnesota, does this interview. Jimmy Butler gives a great interview. Rachel asked him about uh, how he's treating Carl Anthony Towns. Jimmy Butler said, am I being tough on him? Yeah, that's who I am. I'm not the most talented player on the team. Who is the most talented player on our team? Cat. Who is the most God-gifted player on our team? Wiggs. I would like to know what, how you decide that. How do we decide who is the most talented and who is the most God-gifted? <laughs> Just out of curiosity. Wow. Well, Jimmy has some strong opinions. <laughs> okay. But like, did God tell Jimmy Butler that Wiggins was I think more talented than I think he's maybe trying to play both sides. Like if you're if you're religious, you're like, okay, God given yeah. talent to wake to Wiggins, and then if you're not, then that's talent. I don't have the proper sourcing <laughs> yeah. to be sure about that. You know, but I've heard some things. You don't have the book of Andrew Wiggins <laughs> well, brought down from you from the mountain. Maybe I can't it has to do it. with Kim. Uh, who can say? Who plays the hardest? Me. I play hard. I put my body on the line every day in practice, every day in games. That's my passion. Everybody leads in different ways. That's how I show I'm here for you. We're not even done yet. Nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Meanwhile, another major thing that seems to be uh, stuck in Jimmy's craw is the idea that people are leaking stuff. That people are going, like, he, he'll be like, who said what I said in practice? And nobody will say anything. And he's just like, nobody's being honest. His main thing was like, we're not being truthful with each other. We're not being honest with each other. Why can't we be honest with each other? It's not personal. Was it the right way to do it, Jimmy said? No. <laughs> <laughs> Great self-reflection. So... It was a classic non-apology. He was like, it wasn't the right way to do things, but it was awesome. It was like, basically, like, I was Maximus from Gladiator, Mm -hmm. and all these guys have to kiss the ring now. Is it fixable? It could be. Do I think it is? No. Again, where, what's the difference? The difference is, if I don't get traded, I will take, take over this team. Yes, this is a hostage crisis. But then, I'm like, Jimmy, that's exactly what Thibodeau wants to hear. Yes. He wants more intensity. Right. And so, so it fuels him. Basically, here's where we're at. And we're going to get into this. I want, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just setting the table here. <laughs> There's some speculation that Jimmy, obviously, for as much as he was like, I just got out there, the adrenaline hit me. I haven't played basketball in a long time. I'm a very emotional player. Yeah, apparently he was like super out of shape, which yeah. is hilarious. And still destroyed Carl Anthony Towns playing with literally three guys I've never heard of. James yeah, Jonathan like, like, who, Shout out to Jonathan Sharks for being like, that guy's actually better than Anthony Collins. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um... There's some speculation that this is entirely staged, that he knew, he, he called Rachel, said, fly to Minnesota, there's going to be an interesting story for you when you get here, that the whole thing is basically to put the Timberwolves in a completely untenable situation, that they can't have him come back. He essentially comes back to this team and ruins <laughs> their preseason. Mm-hmm. I mean, not that he already hadn't done that, but essentially like targets a guy who they just paid $190 million, which apparently bothers him. That was another thing that he was he wanted to confront Cat about was that essentially that it was like Jimmy asks for a trade, Carl signs his new deal, it's Carl's team now. I, maybe that's what he's upset about. God only knows what he is upset about. Oh. Seems like he's upset about everything. But he's yeah. trying to leave. It would have been Carl's team anyway. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Guess what? It is Carl's team. Yeah. Carl Towns has the ability to be the next Tim Duncan. 
that is the, that that if you were if you were actually looking at this team and you were looking at who is what age has suffered what injuries is a good face for this franchise that needs a face of the franchise mm-hmm. and is not going to hold this franchise hostage with this needs to be the coach this is how we need to play here's how these players need to interact with me here's how I feel about this this community Jimmy Butler wants Adam Minnesota I feel like it, once you state that. You can keep him out and you can hold him for as much leverage as you want in terms of a trade, but you cannot bring him into the gym. This is what happens. Yeah, I, it, clearly Jimmy was making a point. <laughs> it, it, it seems like it was this whole show was for. It reminded me of when I'm editing a story and I'm like, we really need to show this, not just tell this. He really wanted to put a scene yeah. To, yeah. To, to what he had. Right. Yeah. And because ultimately what he did was just underline his basic concerns for wanting to get out in the first place. Nothing is different as a result. It only just enhanced our understanding of the story that was already in existence. So did you guys see the... What the coaches said afterwards? Yes. And I saw what Jimmy said about the coaches afterwards. Well, okay. Let's go over the coaches first. So SVG talked to the Minnesota coaching staff, and they said, best practice of the season. Loved the intensity. Yep. So good. Mm-hmm. So what did he say back? Uh, Thibodeau said, I loved, like, basically said something to Woj that was like, I love, he's such a competitor. <laughs> I love, I loved, like, what he brought to the table. Jimmy Butler allegedly started screaming at Scott Layden, the GM. Tibbs is handpicked GM mm-hmm. about how the, the they can't win without him and they need him even though he is asking for a trade. It's I, so conflicting. Then he told Rachel that Tom Thibodeau was somewhere locked in his office smiling because he loves confrontation and he mm-hmm. loves this kind of attitude and this kind of... Now, okay, this is one of those things, this is one of those stories where I think that your interpretation of it is largely going to be based on like whether or not you've played sports and whether or not you've played professional sports. That's that's fair enough. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of people will read this story and be like, I fucking love this. That's exactly what you want. <laughs> Accountability. Guys bringing it in practice and just showing everybody what it takes to win. Here's what I think, though. I think Jimmy Butler is the best player on a 500 team. I understand that Jimmy Butler is an effort merchant and Jimmy Butler plays really hard and Jimmy nobody believed in Jimmy Butler and nobody thought Jimmy Butler was like, going to be who he is. But I think that Jimmy Butler is somewhat overselling Jimmy Butler right now. Jimmy Butler doesn't win championships. Jimmy Butler can't be the best player on a championship team. He can barely be the best player on a playoff team. I disagree because I don't think he's overselling himself. He said he's not the most talented. He said he's not the most God gifted, which we all know are very different. (laughs) He's just saying you guys need me, which we obviously saw last year. Nobody is intense at all. Well, I mean, Wiggins and Towns aren't intense I don't think those things happen in a vacuum. I think Jimmy, I don't think Jimmy Butler is like I'm an asshole, and none of these guys are playing hard. Okay, but without him, who's yeah. playing hard? Taj Gibson? I don't know. We didn't find out because we never found. We never got to see Towns and Wiggins be like, okay, this is our team now. Yeah, we did in 2017 with a bad with bad 17. coaching though, right? They had one that year was, with Tibbs. That was still Tibbs. So they were all right. So like, run that back. So when when did he had one year with 16, 17. Yes, seventeen, eighteen is with Butler. Yep. Yes, right. But that's the thing is like, can we even make the argument like, oh, it'd be different now. They're so grown up. I mean, Towns looks like you're supposed to improve, like getting used to the league every year, but they're not like substantially better players. It's also like the worst possible look for them. Like that, like yesterday oh was the God. worst possible can you look. Imagine? Like, like we're talking about, okay, like Towns can be this the franchise cornerstone and whatnot, but you obviously need you're going to need players down the line to come and play with him. Yeah. And and did, 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 how much did yesterday's like events ruin his... I mean, like, yeah, maybe I'm over-exaggerating over a little bit, but at the same time, like... He's torpedoing the value of a guy they yeah, just committed like exactly. 40% of their cap. Of both of them. Yeah, and Andrew Wiggins <laughs> dapped him up. Yeah. Here's the he thing. He tapped out. I think... Jimmy's right about all of this. I yeah. think the methods with which he's decided to yell it into the ether uh-huh. is complicated and just makes things worse ultimately. Uh, but I think everything that he's saying are things that we said last year about the Timberwolves. We all said that Andrew Wiggins needs to try more. Steven Jackson is on Instagram or whatever the hell he's doing, smoking whatever I- he was smoking, saying that exact same thing. And then Cat. Like, yes, he has all this talent, but where is the production? You saw the way, or reportedly, his teammates tuned out when he tried to uh, express that they needed to rally around him and not Butler. And Butler was the guy who was supposed to galvanize the team and instill this in all of them, and that's why Tibbs got him. It's just, it all makes sense, 
But the fact that Butler has to scream it is the issue. The fact that nobody got the message is led him to this place. Yes, and the fact and that Tom Thibodeau is letting it happen, That's even though this thing. guy yeah. is like, I want out of here. And even though the Timberwolves just gave the max to Carl Towns and be like, be our franchise. And then Thibodeau is like, by all means, practice, embarrass this kid, yes. scream on him, and then have it leaked, and then go to Rachel Nichols and have a Sports Center segment where you're like, cat's a joke. Then this is like a then the T Wolves are the joke. I was trying to do a right. winners and losers this entire situation. There are no winners. <laughs> the only winner is Jimmy's agent. Who I is think a- Rachel Nichols is probably a winner. Sure. Yeah. 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 I mean, sure. like the media, yeah. the fact that we have something to talk about instead right. of just like Content. random power rankings and predictions is great. Yes. Mm-hmm. But but like everybody else involved is a joke. Right. This is typical. Like when you look at who's to blame here, you always go to the top. It's the infrastructure that's the issue. Tibbs is setting the agenda. He he asked Butler to come in and to provide this for the team. And he almost let in like uh, this, this anarchist in there. And as he a result, he yeah. burned everything. to. It's the like ground. gangsters using the Joker. Yes. Well, the thing yes. I, I wrote in the blog that I wrote yesterday about it was also that this may, he, like Thibs may not be long for the, for the wolves either. So like in, in his I, mind, I it's, completely think that's true. Yeah. So in his mind, it's like, why not? Why not have Jimmy come in and like show what the real deal is here? You know what I'm saying? Like, Maybe that's the thinking. And it's just the same criticism of Tibbs over and over again where he wants to do things where, that were successful in the past. Mm-hmm. And we've seen it more like on the court and more notably with the way that he's playing defense where he's still like Jeff T came out yesterday and essentially was like, we're the only team that isn't switching now. But here he kind of relies on toughness and grit and yelling and being fiery. When you see the teams across the league, the ones that are having significant amount of success are the ones that can really get along and have fun on the court. The Warriors have really championed this whole idea where it's like we don't have to have just one alpha or whatever. We just pass it around. The ball moves and and. This is just the example of how he's just like, it's filtering into everything that they're doing. It's coming from the top, and it, it ultimately, Tibbs is the blame. I, I don't know why you would keep him around after this. Well, you're right that he's embracing this kind of thing, and like I think that's why he loved the idea of this practice. And when we were walking over here, I love this story because it's the kind of stories— like you see on an old 30 for 30 or mm-hmm. like my dad <laughs> used to tell me about like when he used to watch the NBA and— but it doesn't happen anymore for a reason. It's because we understand that that's not healthy for team dynamic or chemistry. And the yeah. only way it could have happened is in a way that feels very much like set up. And not you know organically. what this is? Also, is this is a crisis of identity. Because this is the Timberwolves hiring Tom Thibodeau because they were tired of missing the playoffs. And Tom Thibodeau getting Jimmy Butler because he wasn't getting through to Carl Anthony Towns and Andrew Wiggins. And Jimmy Butler coming in. And being his floor general and regulating and screaming at these guys. And it's the same thing that happened in Chicago where there was a divide generationally between Rondo and Jimmy versus some of the younger kids. And Wade. Yeah. Wade was up there too. Yeah. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. some of the younger kids. And some of those younger kids probably feeling the same way, which is like, I get yelled at a lot by this guy, but I can... I can point out some stuff that I think is wrong with this guy's game too, or maybe wrong with this guy's, the way this guy handles his career Mm -hmm. or the way that this guy goes about his job on a daily basis. But nobody wants to hear that because Jimmy Butler is like, well, I'll break my leg playing for this team and I play hard every night. And that's just like, he basically uses his work ethic as like a, uh, like a brand, you know what I mean? So I think that this is a situation where the wolves thought that they were closer than they were. A lot of teams are better than the wolves. And rather than slowly bringing along Towns and Wiggins with a coach who understands how to nurture young talent, honestly, you can see what's happened with Chicago since Jimmy and Wade and Rondo and Miritich have left. Hoiberg's actually got like a pretty decent young nucleus and people have like some positivity about that team. And guys like Zach Levine and guys like Chris Dunn who were wasted in Minnesota might be actually okay. So I don't know. I don't know. I mean, are the Wolves going to win more than 40 games? Maybe not. No, not with Jimmy. Or yeah, not without Jimmy, know sorry. The, yeah. No, I mean, are the, sorry, are the Bulls going to win more than 40 games with that team? Maybe not, but those no. 40 wins will feel really good because you'll be like, we're going in the right direction. I don't think right. you necessarily well, like, need them to win 40 games this yeah. year. Exactly. And, 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 exactly. Right, that's the thing. And they have like a runway to just kind of just buy their time and wait for either, you know, Lori to get, to become like a top, like a top 20 NBA player, if you will. Right. So, you know, it's like, it's, it's, it's instituting patience. Like you said, an identity thing of where it's like, the Wolves are more about the now, which... I mean, the Warriors guys, come on. I would push back. I I would just say that maybe the Bulls have something, but I think it is the trade-off there where you're trading off 
hope for something that's different versus the tangible of what Jimmy can bring. I think he he can turn a team into a playoff team. We saw that. They were a top three seed last year before he went down. Mm -hmm. And with a team like Minnesota, you understand the desperation they have simply because of the history that they've had there where they haven't made the playoffs since Kevin Garnett left. And so it is just... Yes, maybe in a vacuum, the Bulls are doing things the right way in air quotes. But as we've seen the way that they've reached for Jabari Parker, it doesn't really always work out as, as cleanly. as Yeah, but hope. giving Jabari Parker a two year deal is way different than giving J- J- Jimmy Butler a five year deal. Yeah. Well, and then I also I think and paying that, Jimmy Butler $40 million when he's definitely going to be playing on one leg or probably going to be playing on one leg. Yeah, but you know he's going to be hustling on that one <laughs> leg, <laughs> crawling that to the back. He'll play defense, yeah. for sure. <laughs> Tripping people. I think that he would have been totally fine to stay in Minnesota and because this is the workings of something that you could see when he, when he came to the team from far away as someone who could contend. But then this is why he's so frustrated is that nothing else was done by the guy who brought him in, who he trusted, to get them there. He signed Derrick Rose at a time when they needed some shooting. Mm -hmm. He signed Luol Deng this Mm offseason. Wouldn't you be so frustrated that you have these two young guys, and that's already annoying because they're not playing as hard as they can, given their talent. But also, like, nothing's coming in from the top to help you either. But do we know that, like, Jimmy didn't like that they signed Derrick Rose and, and, and Would you? Dang? I mean, I don't know. And like, also, that's and the also thing. The I don't know. Because he, and, he demanded and it right after Dang signed. Yeah. And, and their, like, their whole offseason was giving Cat money and signing Anthony Tolliver. And as we've seen, like, he doesn't have a high opinion of Cat. And the way that, he, to Haley's point, it seems like he's just. He does things that are just in the past. It's almost like if Chris was like, let's double down on agate pages, you know? Mm-hmm. It's, it's just, it doesn't work anymore. Yeah. I mean, I, I honestly, like nothing would surprise me about this anymore. I mean, if I were, I think the funniest possible thing that would happen right now is if Carl Towns was like, he can have this team. Trade me. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Trade me to Brooklyn. Like, yes. He, he can have it. If he wants this team, if he doesn't think I work hard enough, if the Timberwolves don't have my back to, to like s- create his work, a work environment in which I can figure out how to like lead this team into the next season. If these guys don't want to listen to me and the coach doesn't believe in me, trade me. Trade me. I to think Wiggins is definitely more likely to be that guy. Yeah. Yeah. But Wiggins, but da- like what you said, Wiggins <laughs> dapped up Butler. Like Wiggins is like kind of like, oh, okay. Like if I were Towns, I'd be like, this doesn't working. Something that's I don't in- know when you can get traded after you sign one of these big deals or like what you have the- to wait. It's usually like mid December. Sure. Yeah. So just yeah. be like, holler at me in mid-December. Are you telling me that like half the, like what, two-thirds of the league wouldn't be like, what do you want for Towns right now? Yeah. yeah. You don't think the Spurs would be like, what can we give you for <laughs> Towns? You don't think the Nets, you don't think, you don't think Riley would be like, forget Jimmy Butler, I want Carl Towns. Right. I'll fix Carl Towns. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this is it. It is like, this, I, I, don't, I don't even know like where else these guys go from here. Yeah. I mean, something that's interesting to me, not to zoom out too much, but is like in this kind of new stage of players demanding things and trades and getting out of, you know, pre-agency and all of that. What do you do with these guys who are in this, like, top 8 to top 20 range of superstars that have some power, but, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, somebody mm-hmm. like Jimmy, you're not going to, like, throw away everything for just because, like, he's requesting something as opposed to, like, somebody like Kawhi where it's different. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I think this new age of, like, player power and player agency is going to be more interesting to watch with those kind of in between guys that are not the top level superstars, but are more toward the back end. Of in like terms of them team. agitating for moves, yeah, I would say Kyrie falls in that. Yeah, right. But, but he got what sort of. Well, he didn't get what he wanted, but he got the best case scenario. Yeah, yeah. I mean, with Jimmy, is just the whole thing we were talking about before. He's twenty nine and, and wants a max contract. Like I would be pushing for this as, as well, just because I don't know what my future holds. I mean, he missed how many games last season, and we were talking about going into the off season whether or not he would rush to take an extension simply because we didn't know what his future was because of that injury. So, I I think you make a really good point. I, I just don't know what type of player you're getting and for how long. And it's funny, Charks mentioned this in our Slack the other day, but the team that should be trading for him and o- probably the only team that should be trading for him is a team that's built to win next season, like Houston. Yes. Mm-hmm. Simply because, like, maybe you pay the tax of a couple, uh, his year, like, five or four where it's a bad contract, but right now you get a player that can impact you. Other than that, like, I don't know why the Nets give up anything and you look at the package that's reportedly on the table from the Heat, like, it's Josh Richardson and not much else. Like, mm-hmm. that's probably why. I still think he gets traded in the next couple of days, honestly. I, I think so. I, I think that this was, I think this is Tibbs' middle finger to Glenn Taylor. He's just like, this is what, 
this is what you get for. But for why the next money. couple of days if nothing's happened so far? What changes in the next couple of days? Because they'd have to pay him to not play. I mean, they have to pay him to stay away. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I after this, do you guys really think public. that Jimmy Butler can sit out? That's the other thing. Right. Like, do you think he can see a game? It sounds like he changes out? his mind a lot about that. I've been yeah. reading this stuff. I mean, over the course of the last couple of weeks, he's been like, I want to be traded. Then there's like a feeling that he might be a pro and and come to work anyway because he has a contract. Yeah. And then there's like, well, you know, is that really wise for them to do that? Is there any way in which this team wins games in the West <laughs> with their, their, their best player basically effectively giving up on the team if they give it back to Jimmy? I, I don't know. The funny thing is I think Jimmy would give up on the team as a whole, but like in a on a game to game basis, would actually like go out in forty eight minutes. You know what I'm saying? Like go all out forty eight minutes, to which is what? such a weird thing. <laughs> to but do like, what? Like what? Yeah, is this I team? mean, it's just I could totally see him doing the Kobe move of just only passing for an entire game, not taking an entire shot, because this is essentially what it is. This is just like Kobe Redux and in, in late era Kobe Redux. There, there. This this is about as bad as I've seen it for a team. I mean, this this is a team that at any given moment could lose its its all star player and its coach and its president. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's the other. I think thing. that's best case scenario, though. That's what? best case that's, scenario. Yeah, mm-hmm. that they fire Tibbs, kind of start it over, get Jimmy out of the there. Best case. Bring in like a pick <laughs> and a young player. <laughs> well, that's the question. Like going, let's say Jimmy gets traded. Ultimately, they bring on, let's say, a Josh Richardson. Like, what is the future of this team? Can they go team... back down to where the tenth seed, where yeah, the yeah, but it's seed. like what we talked about last we're week. Building. Finally, they're open again. Yeah, they have flexibility. They were going down the yeah. wrong road. All of a sudden, they have this opportunity to take a U turn. They get off of Gorgie. They send him to Miami. With like that was apparently one of the the, the stopping points. Is that the, later in the deal they were like, can you also take Gorgie? Right. If they can get off Gorgie, if they can free up some money, but at the same time you have two max contracts to players who haven't lived up to it. And I think, like you said, I think Towns eventually gets there. Mm-hmm. I, I am buying Towns stock simply because I think he's just been diminished by what Jimmy is saying about him. And yes, he has some issues, but it reminds me so much of Anthony Davis when Anthony Davis had some injuries. Maybe he wasn't trying as hard on the defensive end, but the talent is so there. Mm-hmm. Um, and like a few years ago, we were saying Towns, like we would take Towns over Davis. Like these things switch so quickly. Yeah, But you're still committed to a lot of money there. Like, how do you even get these other guys to join them simply because Minnesota is in destination? There are a lot of questions. It's basically the same question they were facing before they traded Jimmy. Like, what trade is our for next Jimmy? Yeah. Trade for yeah, Jimmy. Yeah. What is our next move? How do we go about it? And I don't know. They really need another reboot after they've rebooted, what, <laughs> twice in the past two years. I'll right? tell you one thing. The, the market for Jimmy now, it's not radically different, but I was, it just, if you see, if you read all this stuff, and Jimmy has obviously corroborated all this, like r- r- all the rumors, Rachel was like, you know, here's all the reports out of practice. Is it true? And he's like, most of it. You she know read I mean? the, the Woj tweets yeah. to him. He's like, how yeah. does this guy know everything? You know what I mean? It's like, agent is telling you. Know what I mean? Like, yeah. um, I got to say, I wouldn't want him on the Sixers. Yeah. Okay. I, w- I wouldn't want him like within 10 feet of the Sixers. Yeah, I don't think he. Would you him. want him on a young, up and coming team? Would you no. want him on and the Bucks? And this goes back to what. Would you want Charts him on the Bucks? Saying. Being like, I don't like Mike Budenholzer's offense. I'm going to do my thing. I think if he had like minded. I don't know. I'd kind of see him on though. the Bucks. I would love yeah. to see him on the Sixers. But like, do you, after no. watching this, do I really want Jimmy Butler and Markel Fultz Giannis. in the same locker room? Oh my God. Yeah, I guess <laughs> do I want Joel Embiid and Jimmy Butler in the same locker room? No. Yeah. And maybe he was making a big show of things simply because he thinks he fits the Heat culture so much. And it was kind of like, come mm-hmm. get me. Mm-hmm. Like, I am your type of guy. I am, like, we always talk about how the Heat are so regimented. It's almost like militaristic in the way that they're just like, they're process oriented. Um, to me, the whole thing was like, holy shit, this is a Heat guy. This is a Pat Riley guy. Got to imagine what the yeah. phone conversations were like between Jimmy and Pat. <laughs> <laughs> and then between Pat and Tibbs. So much intensity. Oh my All right. So, really quickly, where do you think Jimmy Butler is playing by the All Star after the, All-Star, the deadline, the trade deadline? Probably in Miami. Yeah, Miami makes most sense. I want to like switch it up, just lead <laughs> into Miami. Uh, I'll say Houston. I'm gonna agree with you. Yeah, yeah. why not? That'd be like, fun. I, I sh- like it's a Daryl Morey move, right? To, to 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 just go in and like get the guy who's available and then figure it out later. And then I know that the reports are that they don't want to give up PJ Tucker, which like, I understand on, on in theory. But at the end of the day, like if you have Jimmy Butler, Chris Paul, and James Harden. And Mellow. Also, and their, Mello. their owner went dangerously close to tampering by basically being like, we'd love to bring Jimmy Butler yeah. home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was like <laughs> some real like soccer club owner stuff right there. Love it. Uh, okay, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back, talk a little bit more about some other preseason stuff. Believe it or not, there was some and some of our uh, feelings about the upcoming NBA season. 
Hey, it's Bill Simmons. Wanted to tell you about some of the specialty podcasts on the Ringer Podcast Network, like Larry Wilmore's Black on the Air. Larry interviews a variety of guests that usually have to be pretty smart because Larry's a smart guy about politics, sports, culture, you name it. That's called Black on the Air. J.J. Reddick, he has his own podcast. We named it after him. We thought that was a good idea. It's called the J.J. Reddick Podcast. During the season, he's going to pull in not just guests from the basketball world, but guests from outside the basketball world as well. And also the Dave Chang Show. That's happening too. He is one of the best chefs in the world. He has a podcast where he breaks down all the rigors of of starting a restaurant, of maintaining a restaurant, of chefs that are in his world, of celebrities that eat his food. It's a fantastic podcast. Check that out. And then finally, Dual Threat with Ryan Rosillo every Tuesday night during football season. College football, pro football, lots of takes, lots of thought out takes. I even appear on this show from time to time. Dual Threat with Ryan Rosillo. So check all those out. You can subscribe to all of them wherever you get your podcasts. But most importantly, they are all on the Ringer Podcast Network. All right, guys, we are back. Paolo, Justin, Haley, Chris Ryan. It's a group chat podcast. And this is probably this will be the last podcast we do about preseason. Thank God. Um, I just want to ask real quick. Thank Andrew Wiggins, I should say. I'm sorry. <laughs> Who's the one with God-given talent? Yeah, that's a great Who's question. Such a good okay, question. Okay, wait, let's just really quickly do this. <laughs> who here is the Jimmy? Who's the t- who is the Wigs? Who's Cat? And who's Anthony Tolliver? This is not going to go well. I think, <laughs> this is not going to go well. I just want to say, I think I'm Taj Gibson. I'm the glue guy of this podcast. Whoa, it wouldn't wow. run without me. I'm Taj Gibson. I'm like, I'm Tibbs or Jimmy here? I have to be one of the aggressive you're late, ones. You're Scott Lady. <laughs> <laughs> you're Scott Lady. Paolo is... Uh, He's Jeff well. Teague. He's just sitting you're there. You're Teague. Yeah, yeah, you're Jeff Teague. I'll take that. You're having a good That's time. Good. I'm probably... Am I Jimmy? No. What? No. no. Nobody's Definitely Jimmy. not. Do you want to be Jimmy? No, I think I just made that clear that I don't want to be Jimmy. <laughs> Let's talk about other preseason stuff for other teams. I'm t- I don't want to talk about the Wolves anymore. They make me upset. <laughs> uh, the Lakers and the Warriors played last night. You would think it was an NBA Finals game if you looked at NBA Twitter. Um, this was in Vegas. I didn't understand where the three-point line was, but other than that, it seemed like a fun time. <laughs> the T-Mobile Court, what was up with that? Yeah, is that for what, college or what, what do they have? I mean, I know that the Pac-12 tournament is there, but that's like not until March. I don't know what was going on there. I, don't, I, I also is that didn't where the know. Fight, fight was. Is it? Yes. Is the WNBA line shorter? It, it might be. Yeah. Isn't that that's where the Aces pro- play? Yeah, that's where the Aces play. Yeah, okay. Right. Might be well, there anyway, you know. uh, some fun stuff from this game. We got to see the running gun Lakers. Uh, they played against the Warriors. Draymond was out. Boogie was out. Obviously, um, the Lakers were essentially. At, at full health, they had Lonzo back. Uh, give me some of your impressions from this game. The late the the Lakers won. I'm watching right now. I'll, I'll tell you when the I Lakers catch up. won. I actually have yes. Okay. I actually have three numbers. Wow. I don't know if you guys know this. Stats are kind of important in the NBA. Okay. The Lakers <laughs> had 38 fast break points. The Warriors had 17. Wow. Okay. That's which a good is number. like everything I've seen from the Lakers so far is summed up by that, They're which fast. is very fun. But like we said yeah. before. Oh, mm-hmm. my God. LeBron's 33. Okay. Brandon Ingram got to the line 17 times. Classic Vegas refs. That I is a need quick him whistle. him to yeah. keep attacking the paint. But also, I wonder what the over-under was on Brandon Ingram line trips. In it literally pres- didn't exist. Trust me. He had <laughs> no- <laughs> she checked. She he checked. hit 15 of them. Uh-huh. That's okay. great. Last That's season, good. he shot 68.1%. He literally had more free throw attempts than anyone had shot attempts. I can't remember the last time I've ever seen that. The keep, 90s. Keep my man in the game. <laughs> Dwayne Wade, yeah. Okay, and then the last number is first, the lob from LeBron to Lonzo. Lonzo mm-hmm. said afterwards, he was like, this is the first time I've played on a team with LeBron. Because they first? haven't played oh. together. Oh, that's yeah. right. Wow. Okay. Beautiful. Um, Thank you. Great stats. Thank you. Yeah, good job. I, I think it was fun. You're, yeah, you're like well, our Lakers no, so, correspondent. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know why, but I'll take it. No, so... The funny thing is like the fast break stuff and all of that. I'm so, so, so curious to see how it actually plays out in a regular season game mm-hmm. where LeBron is not skipping out on the second half because every preseason game he has not played the second half. Right. That's great. And so I think the Lakers should try to, in some games this season. Not like, play LeBron if, in the second half. Why not? Because they'll lose. Well, okay. <laughs> uh, maybe not pull, Maybe not play him the entire second half, but just give him like an entire quarter. 
I don't know, maybe like, or just like in a huge chunk of time. Like I'm. So very, you're 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 thinking Brewers style. You're like openers and enders. Huh? I mean, why not? If you want LeBron to go all out, if you really want to play this fast paced style, and he clearly can. He almost had a triple double in one half. He and he had a, the buzzer beater three from forty feet. Like he looked really good. In yes, one half. he he looked like very much in shape. Wait, hold on. You're advocating for LeBron plays the first half only. No, 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 this no. City, no. I'm, he's I'm just saying, sleep last night and like made this like whiteboard <laughs> yeah. and like connected things and like he came in this. I, I'm morning. all the way. Is that why you were late, Paul? No, that's not. <laughs> I was late by like a minute. Okay, I'm just saying like. I'm curious to see how Luke staggers LeBron's minutes. Yeah. And I'm wondering like what that looks like on in the regular season in terms of like how much how many minutes per game is he gonna play throughout the season and whether that's gonna change over the course yes, of the season. Because I want them to play fast. And also the idea is here is that LeBron truly needs to be at his peak next season when they ass- they, right. they presumably add another all-star to this team. Mm-hmm. Right. So burning him out at 38 points per game or 38 minutes per game for 80 games this season doesn't make a ton of sense unless it's absolute like they are they are around the third seed or second seed for some reason. Yeah, I, I do want to see the regular season product, not only because of what Paolo said, but also like when the games get tight. Like I do wonder what the te- this team is going to look like when they have to score in the half court. Like, yeah, reg- so many teams play at pace nowadays, and everyone's going to want to run. Everyone says this every preseason. Everyone wants to run. They're clearly making good on it so far. Yeah, running but, is like the fifteen pounds of muscle in football. It's just <laughs> right. like we want to get out and run on teams. It's like yes, of course you do, but that there's problems with that. But at, at a certain point, you have to you have to be able to execute in the half court. And I do wonder if this is a little bit of smoke and mirrors. And and I do wonder if these are the sort of guys that are going to be able to do so. You have LeBron, but who else is there? I don't really get, have a sense yet of what Luke's rotation is because he's been so playful with it. Mm-hmm. So after about three or four weeks in the regular season, assuming he gets this under control, what would you imagine is like the starting five and the three guys off the bench or four guys off the bench? And in what order of those guys, you know? Yeah, I think I think Rondo will start to, to start the season because ideally you want Lonzo to take his spot, but I don't think Lonzo is like 100% yet, yeah. even though he said last night he was 100%. Then he'll Baker Mayfield it a couple games in. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Exactly. So... Also, Rondo will just be like, I have a hamstring thing. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Um, so, Lon- I mean, Rondo, I think Josh Hart should start at the two, but KCP's there. So but Josh Hart's also guarding the four sometimes? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the thing. It's like, it, they're very fluid, if uh-huh. you will. Um, and then, obviously, LeBron, Ingram, and JaVale. JaVale will be the starter. Okay. Can I just say that I think we're getting to the point with the Lakers where we're straying into some coaching bullshit. How so? Well, mm. Josh Hart guarding the four. So wait, just so everybody knows, Justin is making a reference to director bullshit, yes. I think, which is when directors of Marvel movies talk about how their their Marvel movie is going to look a lot like all the president's men. That's like <laughs> yes, inside good. baseball, but inside Slack. Yeah. Well, wow. it's our podcast, Slack. <laughs> so it's, it's, a lot, it's an intertextual reference, but go ahead, Justin. Yeah, I'm really layered. <laughs> what it comes down to. No, I, it just seems like I love the fact that they're trying a bunch of things. I love the fact that they're saying that they're going to push the positional boundaries to the point where a shooting guard, like a six, four, five, five six, yeah. six, five guard, mm-hmm. is essentially guarding, I don't even know, Anthony Tolliver. Uh, I don't or, Anthony Tolliver. Tolliver, Tolliver exactly. Tolliver. Yeah. He's, he's, just, <laughs> he's in, the, in the mind right now. Uh, but I think when it comes down to it, like they're probably going to have to be a lot more conventional than than they even realize or, or are saying that they're going to be. And I think they're going to there's going to be a lot of JaVale McGee at center. There's probably going to be more Kuzma at the four. There's going to be more LeBron and Kuzma sets. So I don't know. I, I actually want to see what happens when you have Anthony Davis and Nikola Meritage going at you. And like, yeah, they're playing fast too, but they're actually fucking huge. And yeah, you have to match yeah. up with that. I yeah. just don't think JaVale gets like more than 20. I mean, he years. literally doesn't play that more than 20 minutes a game. That's what I'm saying. But like, like in his career. Right. You know, yeah. Usually, so usually. I don't know. You're going to have to play Kuzma at the five, which seems incredible. Like, it's not going to go well. And the the whole thing about LeBron being resistant to playing small early in his career is because he didn't want the pounding. And, like, on the Heat, the whole story was Shane Batty was the actually the, the person who was the taking— The defensive power forward. Right. Yeah. LeBron yeah, yeah. Set, got all the credit for playing power forward. He did not actually guard the power forward, which was the whole point of it. Right. So I do wonder, like, at 33, is he really going to, like, switch his mindset Does he want to go much? guard Gobert? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, no. And everyone's switching more, right. which means that he will be matched up with those guys even more. And I wonder if, like, we're late in the season in February, teams are targeting him specifically— uh, to go against some of the bigger guys, matching them up in the post. Haley, you made a Baker Mayfield joke, but it does feel like this Lakers team 
could get like as at least early on could be in some Big Twelve type games. They're like, well, let's just go for let's just I have a fifty four forty eight game and right. see what happens. They're gonna right. be like, let's go one twenty six one eighteen and see who wins, rather than we're gonna grind it out. And what we want is to hold the opposing team under a hundred. You know, like they're not. They may think that they're a defensive minded. I wonder team. when the yeah. I wonder when that backlash is gonna happen. To to what they're trying to do, you mean? Well, specifically targeted to like their defense is terrible. Yeah. Because we already know the Lakers have that reputation. LeBron through the regular seasons, teams tend to have that reputation mm-hmm. as of late. I mean, eventually you're like, this is why they're losing games. Yeah, absolutely. So I wonder right. when that backlash is going to happen. It's funny because I think a lot of it, even with the defense, the switching and you know LeBron's burden, all, all that comes back to what you said last podcast, which is Ingram. And it's like, yeah. kind of mm-hmm. just depends on how he... Like last night, he was guarding KD a little bit. I mean, he was a primary defender on KD. Yeah. Um, so it, it really all, for as much as we can tinker with the lineup and what it's going to look like and what it's going to be closing, like if Ingram doesn't take a big step, it like the chain effect will be will be will come to affect LeBron and 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 the whole team as a well. whole. Yeah, that's ex- that's what I'm so excited about watching with this team. To maybe backtrack a little bit of what I was saying before, like there's so much discussion about who's going to be the point guard next to LeBron and like, well, do do Rondo and Lonzo fit with them because they're more traditional ball handlers? I think the key is when you look at those good Cavs teams, they they were really good simply because Kyrie wasn't a traditional point guard. He was just a secondary creator that allowed LeBron to take plays off and Kyrie could just get his own bucket. And I think, honestly, the best point guard, if we're categorizing Kyrie as a point guard, is probably Brandon Ingram. Yeah. Simply because he is the best creator on this team. And to Haley's point, he's being aggressive. He's getting to the line. And I think when... When LeBron, if, in order to save LeBron for those key moments late in games, he's going to need to be able to dish it off to somebody and just like kind of linger around the three point arc. So I do wonder if this is Ingram's. God, they just don't have enough up top to do that, though. That's the other thing. Like it's Ingram, and then it's a bunch of guys where you're like, well, what are we going to get on this night? Like yeah. maybe we roll the dice with Beasley or Lance or whatever. I'll run through a couple other preseason storylines, none of which are as interesting as the Lakers. Uh, I would just like to ask if you guys watch any Bucks preseason. Like no nope. highlights, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> but, to be honest, yeah. Shoot. But you have though. I have. I yeah. have. I'm pretty excited about this team. I'm yeah. pretty excited about the possibilities of this team, and I think that you know it kind of ties into what we were talking about before about what kind of environment do you want to create for a budding superstar? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Buddy, buddy, well, pun intended. Quite nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, Giannis was talking recently. There's been a, a, a bunch of, of Giannis stuff in the last couple of days. Kevin wrote something for our site about him. Um, he's been talking about how like Bud's just like, I don't, I need you to shoot it. Like it's part of the offense and I don't want you to think about it. I don't want you to worry about it. I need you to be a three point shooter and you need to at least be a threat from behind the arc. And he's like that to me to know that they are depending on my shooting is the challenge almost that I need to become a better shooter, you know? And I think everybody, I think he was obviously aware that like his shooting was the sort of Achilles heel in his game, but it's fascinating to watch them make this right decision to and to try and sort of build around this idea of what's the optimal basketball environment for this guy? What should we do with this guy? What if we spread this floor and have him standing at the top of the key? Like what what's possible here? And this is the exact opposite of what they're doing with towns in Minnesota. So it's not so much that I'm like you can draw so many conclusions from watching the like Milwaukee versus Brooklyn in preseason, although they're quite obviously like in you know installing parts of bud's offense and it looks pretty cool as much as it's like that's how you run someone's career and not how minnesota is doing it yeah i mean the decisions they're making now with Giannis are go- are essentially going to dictate whether or not he stays there long term yes like mm-hmm. he still has however many years he has on his contract i believe two or three or something but these things add up like the moves you're making three years from now ultimately ripple into the future. I mean, it's the same thing with the Sam Hinkie. Like, yeah, a win to get one more second rounder isn't going to like do much for you in the present. But yeah. you build all those second rounders and eventually you get a first rounder or you do whatever with them. Uh, and it reminds me a lot to to harken back to the Pelicans again. It just it's like bringing in Alvin Gentry for Anthony Davis. Like, yeah, people thought like, well, he can maybe shoot threes. But Alvin really got in there and was like, you're shooting every time you can Mm -hmm. not only because of the gravity it creates on the court but long term we need you to be able to hit those shots 
And you've seen him develop, like, and it's crazy to see him now simply because, like, before Alvin got there, he was picking and popping. He was rolling hard to the rim. He was more of a traditional big man. He was more Giannis-esque, mm-hmm. to be honest. Mm-hmm. Uh, and now he's basically, like, he's dribbling. Like, he's bringing it down the court. Like, he looks more like Brandon Ingram mm-hmm. in certain situations. So it's just, it's fascinating to watch because this decision with Bud is ultimately going to decide what Giannis will be in the NBA. Absolutely. It's such a good foil to, especially in the East, to the the Celtics and the Sixers who are more have a bunch of guys, you yeah. know, to to have one team that's going to build around one guy and let them just go to work and build the entire, like you said, team around him. Like that's going to be so much fun to watch. Everyone else is also going to look so much better around him. Yeah. yeah. And like you said earlier, when Giannis said that that inspired him or it made him realize that he had to shoot threes, Giannis loved Jason Kidd. Yeah. He was upset that he got fired. <laughs> yeah. Can you that's imagine true. this relationship <laughs> yeah. with Bud? He's going to think he's God. I'm sure that there are guys who on the in Minnesota who are like, I love Tibbs. Who? I, I don't know. Who? Well, I don't. Derek surprised. Rose for paying him? Yeah. Yes, I mean, like, sure. <laughs> he's got a contingent of Chicago guys there who are probably like, this is how it works. Yeah. You grind and you grind and you grind. And if you repeat and repeat and repeat, it works. Yeah, it eventually that's starts not, working. It doesn't work. That's yeah. why they didn't win in 2011. <laughs> it doesn't work. Like right. nope. If that's really what they think, they're all just in as much denial as he is. Yeah, but to Chris's point, you are kind of giving over your entire career in the hands of someone that you really don't have much of a decision over. Like, Giannis probably had input over Bud, but like ultimately, he he's going to dictate a lot of his future. Yeah. And Giannis kind of has to be beholden to whatever he thinks he sees for him. And it's it's really funny that we're doing this on the same day as Jimmy because Giannis is completely like the opposite. I know he's like Jimmy. everything is amazing. I've never had a smoothie before. And, <laughs> I, uh, yeah. I love Jason Kidd. He was so good for me. Uh, we'll wrap it up there. Uh, we'll be back next Thursday. I just want to like remind you guys we have Ringer NBA Palooza happening on Tuesday. It's a full day of video programming that culminates with a watch along with Bill Simmons and some special guests on uh, Tuesday for the Sixer Celtics game. Uh, so we have a ton of stuff there. We have a ton of stuff in our NBA preview on the site. You should also be checking out the NBA show all week long with Gons, Chris and Verno. Obviously, sources say we'll be back next week with that. Group chat and many, many, many other great shows. So until next week, thank you for listening. Basketball is very good. Basketball is very good.